And here is Mr. Bernstein. You know, the shape of a musical composition is the hardest thing for most people to grasp. They can remember a tune or a rhythm easily enough, even harmonies and counterpoints, but the form is harder to understand because grasping the form of a piece means seeing it all at once, or I should say hearing it all at once, which is, of course, impossible, since music takes place in time instead of in space. So how can you hear it all at once? You see, you can see the form of a painting, for instance, or a church, more or less all at once, because their forms exist in space. When you look at this stage, for instance, you see its whole form instantly, and you can take pleasure in its proportions and its balances. But with a piece of music, it takes time to hear the form. You have to keep in your head all the notes you've already heard while you're listening to the new ones, so that by the time the piece is over, it all adds up to one continuous form. Now, maybe that sounds impossible, but it's not. Of course, it's not easy either. But if you know a little about the form in advance, for instance, if you know the piece is going to be in sonata form, then it all becomes much easier because you can almost predict what musical shapes are going to happen. And that's what we're going to do now by finding out what a sonata is. Now, this word sonata originally meant simply a piece of music. It comes from the Latin word sonare, to sound. So a sonata is anything that is sounded by instruments as opposed to a cantata, which is anything that is sung, from the Latin word cantare, to sing. But it's only in the last 200 years or so that the word sonata has acquired a special meaning which describes the form of a piece, and in particular the first movement of a piece. And this first movement form, which is known as sonata form, laid the foundations of the symphony as we have known it from that time, almost 200 years ago, right on into our own 20th century. Now, how can we explain this immense popularity and growth of sonata form over 200 years? What makes it so satisfying and so complete? Well, two things, really. First, it's perfect three-part balance. Remember that. And second, the excitement of its contrasting elements, balance and contrast. In those two words, we have the main secrets of sonata form. Now, first, let's consider that three-part design I talked about. This is something we can see all around us. If you think of a bridge with two great towers rising on either side of a river and the connecting span sweeping over the water between them, that's a three-part form. One, two, three. Or think of an elm tree with its central trunk and the umbrella-shaped branches arching out on both sides. That's another three-part structure. One, two, three. Or the three-part balance of a human face with its centerpiece of nose and mouth and its two mirror-like side pieces of eyes and ears. Again, three-part form. One, two, three. Now, of course, any form as basic and natural as that in life must be just as natural in music. And so it is. The most basic form of a simple song is usually a three-part form. Take the old nursery tune that we all know as Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, for instance. There's a first part, which we'll call A. That's A. Then comes a middle part, which we'll call B. And finally, we return to the first part, A, again. And the song is over. Now, that's a clear, exact three-part form, A, B, A. Now let's see how this simple little construction grows in size when it's used in a slightly larger song form, say, a modern popular song. Now, in fact, most pop tunes stick to this ABA pattern very strictly. The only difference here, and this is important as you'll see later, is that usually the first A section is repeated right away before the B section comes so that the pattern is really A-A-B-A -A -A instead of just ABA. 
but it's still made out of those same three parts, A, B, A, only the first part is played twice in a row. That's not hard. Uh, let's take a, a pop tune. In fact, let's take a typical Beatles tune and see what happens. Uh, here, first, there's an A section. I give her all my love. That's all I do. And if you saw my love, you'd love her too. I love her. That's A, all right? That's what's... <laughs> now, now what happens? That A section is repeated exactly the same. She gives me everything and tenderly and so on right down to and I love her. That's the end of the repeated A section, right? Right. Now comes the contrasting B section. A love like ours could never die. I think that's how it goes. As long as I have you near me. That's the B. And that brings us back again to the original A section in all its glory. Bright are the stars that shine dark is the night and so on right to the end of the piece well that <laughs> that that represents a small step forward from twinkle twinkle little star it's small but it's a step because it's grown in size and it has that extra deluxe feature the repeat of the first a section which twinkle twinkle does not have I think we're ready to take the plunge into sonata form itself because a typical sonata movement is really only a more expanded version of a three-part song form, even to the balancing of its two A sections on either side of the central B section. And here's where those nasty roadmap names come in. I'm sorry, but they have to. The first part, or A section, is called the exposition. And this is where the themes of the movement are stated for the first time, or exposed, if you will, therefore the word exposition. This is then followed by the B section, in which one or some or all of those themes are developed in different ways, and so it is called the development section. And finally, just as you expected, we get the A section stated again, and this third part is usually called, watch out, the recapitulation. Now, that's a tough one, and actually, I'm not too crazy about these terms either, but what can we do? We have to use the words that are most commonly used in order to be understood, so I guess we're stuck with those words, exposition, development, and recapitulation for our ABA. But whatever words we use, the idea of those three parts is still clear and simple. That feeling of balance we get from two similar sections, A and A, situated on either side of the central development section, just as the ears are situated in balancing positions toward the nose. But you remember I said that there were two main secrets to the sonata. There's balance and contrast. And this idea of contrast is just as important as the other idea of balance, because it's what gives the sonata its drama and its excitement. Now, how does this contrast take place? I'll show you. And here. I'm going to have to get a little technical for a minute or two, but I'm sure you won't mind that, because what I'm going to show you now is very important. In fact, this is the root of the whole sonata business, and that is the sense of key or tonality. Now, most music that we hear is written in one key or another. Not so much concert music that's written these days, but most of the music you're likely to hear is in a key. Now, for instance, the Beatles song we played before is in this key, and I love her, that's F major, but it could also be in G major, and I love her, or it could be in C major, and I love her, or in any of 12 other different major keys, not 12 other, 12 in all, but whatever key it's in, let's say C major, you feel a key note, a center, or home plate, where the music belongs. It starts out from there and gets back to there. And that home plate center is called the tonic. And 
the tonic note is the first note of that scale. And the tonic chord is the chord you build on top of that note. That's it. Now, all the other notes of the scale also have names, but I won't bother you with them, except for this one, which I'd like you to remember, the dominant. That's the name given to the fifth note of any scale. One, two, three, four, five. In this key of C major, the fifth note happens to be G. And the dominant chord is the chord that's built on that note. That's the dominant. Now comes the main event, how these two key centers, the tonic and the dominant, relate to each other. If I play a tonic and a dominant chord in that order, what do you feel? Something is left unfinished, unresolved, isn't it? You feel a desperate urge to get back to the tonic where you started, don't you? Okay, let's play those two chords in their reverse order, dominant and then tonic. Now you feel satisfied, don't you? So you see, that tonic is like a magnet. You can pull away from it, going to all kinds of other chords, other keys, other tonal centers. But in the end, the tonic always pulls you back. And out of this magnetic pull, away from and back to the tonic, classical sonata form is built. That's where the drama lies, the tension in the contrast of keys with one another. Now let's see how this works in an actual piece of music by Mozart. The composer will naturally begin his sonata in the key of the tonic, and his opening theme will be in that key, as in this famous C major sonata by Mozart. Here's the main theme. But now, like a magician, he begins to lure us away from the tonic to a new key, to the dominant. There we are in the dominant, in G major, in a whole new key. And in this new key, Mozart gives us a new theme, his second theme which goes like this. And then finally, still in this key of G major, he gives us a little fanfare-like tune with which he closes the exposition. So there we are, solidly established in the dominant key of G major, and the exposition part of this movement is over. Now, at this point in the classical sonata, we usually bump smack into a repeat sign, which means go back to the beginning and play that whole A section, or exposition, that you've just heard all over again. It's just like the Beatles song. You remember A, A, B, A. You repeat that first section. And so for the second time, we hear the full exposition, first theme, second theme, and closing theme, starting in the tonic and winding up in the dominant. But there's no point in playing it all over again for you now. You've just heard it. So we'll go on to the next section. Now, actually, this whole exposition we just heard is like the first act of a drama. The drama of running away from home, of pulling away from that magnet we call the tonic. And now the next act coming up, which is the development, intensifies that drama, that wandering away even farther from home, through even more distant keys, and then finally giving in and coming home in the third act, or recapitulation. That's the drama of it all. So in the second part, or development section of this Mozart sonata, the composer lets his imagination roam free. The themes he has stated in the exposition wander around in one foreign key after another, like a trip around the world. Now, because this particular sonata of Mozart is such a short one, the development section is also very short. In fact, the only theme Mozart does develop is that little fanfare tune we just heard, the closing theme of the exposition. 
But now in the development, he puts it through its paces like this. us back to the third and last section of this three-part sonata form, the recapitulation. And this is the moment when that magnet we were talking about finally wins out and draws us back home to the tonic. And the whole exposition is repeated or recapitulated. Only this time we must hear it all in the tonic key. Even the second theme and the closing theme, which we originally heard in the dominant, so that when the movement is over, we are safely at home in C major, where we began. Now, of course, Mozart, like all geniuses, is full of surprises. He doesn't always play the game according to the rules. In fact, he often gives us much more pleasure by breaking rules than by obeying them. And in this C major sonata of his, he does just that. Where the recapitulation should be in the tonic, in the key of C, Mozart holds out on us. He is still resisting that magnet of the tonic, C major, and instead he gives us the recapitulation in the unexpected key of F. Now Mozart yields and the magnet wins out after all, and the rest of this little movement is all safe and warm back home in C major. <laughs> 